Chapter 1 of A Confession. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confession by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Almer Maud. Chapter 1. I was baptized and brought up in the Orthodox Christian faith. I was taught it in childhood and throughout my boyhood and youth. But when I abandoned the second course of the university at the age of 18, I no longer believed any of the things I had been taught. Judging by certain memories, I never seriously believed them, but it merely relied on what I was taught and on what was professed by grown-up people around me, and that reliance was very unstable. I remember that before I was eleven, a grammar school pupil, Vladimir Milyutin, long since dead, visited us one Sunday and announced that the latest novelty a discovery made at his school. This discovery was that there is no God, and that all we were taught about him is a mere invention. This was in 1838. I remember how interested my elder brothers were in this information. They called me to their council, and we all, I remember, became very animated, and accepted it as something very interesting and quite possible. I remember also that when my elder brother Dmitri, who was by then at the university, suddenly, in the passionate way natural to him, devoted himself to religion and began to attend all the church services, to fast and to lead a pure and moral life, we all, even our elders, unceasingly held him up to ridicule and, for some unknown reason, called him Noah. I remember that Mushin Pushkin, then the curator of Kazan University, when inviting us to dance at his home, ironically persuaded my brother, who was declining the invitation, by the argument that even David danced before the Ark. I sympathized with these jokes made by my elders, and drew from them the conclusion that though it is necessary to learn the catechism and go to church, one must not take these things too seriously. I remember also that I read Voltaire when I was very young, and that his raillery, far from shocking me, amused me very much. My lapse from faith occurred as is usual among people on our level of education. In most cases, I think, it happens thus. A man lives like everybody else, on the basis of principles not merely having nothing in common with religious doctrine, but generally opposed to it. Religious doctrine does not play a part in life. In intercourse with others it is never encountered, and in man's own life he never has to reckon with it. Religious doctrine is professed far away from life and independently of it. If it is encountered, it is only as an external phenomenon disconnected from life. Then as now, it was and is quite impossible to judge by a man's life and conduct whether he is a believer or not. If there be a difference between a man who publicly professes orthodoxy and one who denies it, the difference is not in favor of the former. Then as now, the public profession and confession of orthodoxy was chiefly met among people who were dull and cruel and who considered themselves very important. Ability, honesty, reliability, good nature, and moral conduct were more often met among non-believers. The schools teach the catechism and send the pupils to church, and government officials must produce certificates of having received communion. But a man of our circle who has finished his education and is not in the government service may even now, and formerly it was still easier for him to do so, live for ten or twenty years without once remembering that he is living among Christians, and he is himself reckoned a member of the Orthodox Christian Church. So that now, as formerly religious doctrine, accepted on trust and supported by external pressure, thaws away gradually under the influence of knowledge and experience of life which conflicts with it. And a man very often lives imagining that he still holds intact the religious doctrine imparted to him in childhood, whereas in fact not a trace of it remains. S., a clever and truthful man, once told me a story of how he ceased to believe. Once, on a hunting expedition, when he was already twenty-six, he, at the place where they had put up for the night, knelt down in the evening to pray, a habit retained from childhood. His elder brother, who was at the hunt with him, was lying on some hay and watching him. When S. had finished and was settling down for the night, his brother said to him, So you still do that? They said nothing more to each other, but from that day S. ceased to say his prayers or to go to church, and now he has not prayed, received communion, or gone to church for thirty years. And this is not because he knows his brother's convictions and has joined him in them, nor because he has decided anything in his own soul, but simply because the word spoken by his brother was like the push of a finger onto a wall that was ready to fall by its own weight. The word only showed that where he had thought there was faith, in reality there had long since been an empty space, and that therefore the utterances of words and the making of the signs of the cross and genuflections while praying were quite senseless actions. Becoming conscious of their senselessness, he could not continue them. So it has been and is, I think, with the great majority of people. And speaking of people of our educational level who are sincere with themselves, 
and not of those who make the profession of faith a means of attaining worldly Such aims. Such people are the most fundamental infidels. For if faith is for them a means of attaining any worldly aims, then certainly it is not faith. These people of our education are so placed that the light of knowledge in life has caused an artificial erection to melt away, and they have either already noticed this and swept its place clear, or they have not yet noticed it. The religious doctrine taught me from childhood disappeared in me as in others, but with this difference. That is, from the age of fifteen I began to read philosophical works. My rejection of the doctrine became a conscious one at a very early age. From the time I was sixteen, I ceased to say my prayers and ceased to go to church or to fast in my own volition. I did not believe what had been taught to me in childhood, but I believed in something. What it was I believed in, I could not have said. I believed in a God, or rather I did not deny God, but I could not have said what sort of God. Neither did I deny Christ and his teachings, but what his teachings consisted in, I again could not have said. Looking back on that time, I now see that clearly my faith, my only real faith, that which apart from my animal instincts gave me an impulse in life, was a belief in perfecting myself. But in what this perfecting consisted of and what its object was, I could not have said. I tried to perfect myself mentally. I studied everything I could, anything life threw in my way. I tried to perfect my will. I drew up rules I tried to follow. I perfected myself physically, cultivating my strength and agility by all sorts of exercises, and accustoming myself to endurance and patience by all sorts of privations. And all this I considered to be the pursuit of perfection. The beginning of it all was, of course, moral perfection. But that was soon replaced by perfection in general, by the desire to be better not in my own eyes or those of God, but in the eyes of other people. And very soon this effort again changed into a desire to be stronger than others, to be more famous, more important, and richer than others. End of chapter 1. Chapter 2 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud Someday I will narrate the touching and instructive history of my life during those ten years of my youth. I think very many people have had a like experience. With all my soul I wished to be good, but I was young, passionate, and alone, completely alone, when I sought goodness. Every time I tried to express my most sincere desire, which was to be morally good, I met with contempt and ridicule, but as soon as I yielded to low passions, I was praised and encouraged. Ambition, love of power, covetousness, lasciviousness, pride, anger, and revenge were all respected. Yielding to those passions, I became like the grown-up folk and felt that they approved of me. The kind aunt with whom I lived, herself the purest of beings, always told me that there was nothing she so desired for me as that I should have relations with a married woman. Rien ni form u hune hom comme una liaison avec une femme comme le faux. Another happiness she desired for me was that I should become an aide-de-camp, and if possible, aide-de-camp to the emperor. But the greatest happiness of all would be that I should marry a very rich girl, and so become possessed of as many serfs as possible. I cannot think of those years without horror, loathing, and heartache. I killed men in war and challenged men to duels in order to kill them. I lost at cards, consumed the labor of the peasants, sentenced them to punishments, lived loosely and deceived people. Lying, robbery, adultery of all kinds, drunkenness, violence, murder, there was no crime I did not commit, and in spite of that, people praised my conduct and my contemporaries considered and consider me to be a comparatively moral man. So I lived for ten years. During that time, I began to write from vanity, covetousness, and pride. In my writings, I did the same as in my life. To get fame and money, for the sake of which I wrote, it was necessary to hide the good and to display the evil, and I did so. How often in my writings I contrived to hide under the guise of indifference or even of banter those strivings of mine towards goodness which gave meaning to my life, and I succeeded in this and was praised. At twenty-six years of age I returned to Petersburg after the war and met the writers. They received me as one of themselves and flattered me. And before I had time to look round, I had adopted the views on life of the set of authors I had come among, and these views completely obliterated all my former strivings to improve. They furnished a theory that justified the dissoluteness of my life. The view of life of these people, my comrades in authorship, consisted in this, that life in general goes on developing, and in this development, we, men of thought, have the chief part, and among men of thought it is we, artists and poets, who have the greatest influence. Our vocation is to teach mankind. And lest a simple question should suggest itself, what do I know and what can I teach, 
It was explained that in this theory, it need not be known, that the artist and the poet teach unconsciously. I was considered an admirable artist and poet, and therefore it was very natural for me to adopt this theory. I, artist and poet, wrote and taught without myself knowing what. For this I was paid money. I had excellent food, lodging, women, and society, and I had fame, which showed that what I taught was very good. This faith in the meaning of poetry and in the development of life was a religion, and I was one of its priests. To be its priest was very pleasant and profitable, and I lived a considerable time in this faith without doubting its validity. But in the second and still more third year of this life, I began to doubt the infallibility of this religion and to examine it. My first cause of doubt was that I began to notice that the priests of this religion were not at all in accord amongst themselves. Some said, we are the best and most useful teachers. We teach what is needed, but the others teach wrongly. Others said, no, we are the real teachers, and you teach wrongly. And they disputed, quarreled, abused, cheated, and tricked one another. There were also many among us who did not care who was right and who was wrong, but were simply bent on attaining their covetous aims by means of this activity of ours. All this obliged me to doubt the validity of our creed. Moreover, having begun to doubt the truth of the authors' creed itself, I also began to observe its priests more attentively, and I became convinced that almost all the priests of that religion, the writers, were immoral, and for the most part men of bad, worthless character, much inferior to those who I had met in my former dissipated and military life, but they were self-confident and self-satisfied as only they can be, who are quite holy or who do not know what holiness is. These people revolted me. I became revolting to myself, and I realized that that faith was a fraud. But strange to say, Though I understood this fraud and renounced it, yet I did not renounce the rank these people gave me, the rank of artist, poet, and teacher. I naively imagined that I was a poet and artist and could teach everybody, without myself knowing what I was teaching, and acted accordingly. From my intimacy with these men I acquired a new vice, abnormally developed pride and an insane assurance that it was my vocation to teach men without knowing what. To remember that time in my own state of mind, and that of those men, though there are thousands like them today, is sad and terrible and ludicrous, and arouses exactly the feeling one experiences in a lunatic asylum. We were all then convinced that it was necessary for us to speak, write, and print as quickly as possible, and as much as possible, and that it was all wanted for the good of humanity. And thousands of us, contradicting and abusing one another, all printed and wrote, teaching others, and without noticing that we knew nothing, and that to the simplest of life's questions, what is good and what is evil, we did not know how to reply. We all talked at the same time, not listening to one another, sometimes seconding and praising one another in order to be seconded and praised in turn, sometimes getting angry with one another, just like in a lunatic asylum. Thousands of workmen labored to the extreme limit of their strength day and night, setting the type and printing millions of words which the post carried all over Russia, and still we went on teaching, and could in no way find time to teach enough. We were always angry that sufficient attention was not paid to us. It was terribly strange, but now it is quite comprehensible. Our real innermost concern was to get as much money and praise as possible. To gain that end, we could do nothing except write books and papers. So we did that. But in order to get such useless work and to feel assured that we were very important people, we required a theory justifying our activity. And so among us, this theory was devised. All that exists is reasonable, all that exists develops. And it all develops by the means of culture and culture is measured by the circulation of books and newspapers. And we are paid money and are respected because we write books and newspapers, and therefore we are the most useful and the best of men. This theory would have all been very well if we had been unanimous, but as every thought expressed by one of us was always meant by diametrically opposite thought expressed by another, we ought to have been driven to reflection. But we ignored this. People paid us money and those on our side praised us, so each of us considered himself justified. It is now clear to me that this was just as in a lunatic asylum, but then I only dimly suspected this, and like all lunatics, simply called all men lunatics except myself. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud So I lived, abandoning myself to this insanity for another six years, till my marriage. During that time I went abroad. Life in Europe and my acquaintance with leading and learned Europeans confirmed me yet more in the faith of striving after perfection in which I believed, for I found the same faith among them. That faith took with me the common form it assumes with the majority of educated people of our day, 
it was expressed by the word progress. It then appeared to me that this word meant something. I did not as yet understand that, being tormented, like every vital man, by the question of how it is best for me to live. In my answer, live in conformity with progress, I was like a man in a boat who, when carried along by wind and waves, should reply to what for him is the chief and only question, whither to steer, by saying, we are being carried somewhere. I did not then notice this. Only occasionally, not by reason but by instinct, I revolted against the superstition so common in our day, by which people hide from themselves their lack of understanding of life. So, for instance, during my stay in Paris, the sight of an execution revealed to me the instability of my superstitious belief in progress. When I saw the head part from the body and how they thumped separately into the box, I understood, not with my mind but with my whole being, that no theory of the reasonableness of our present progress could justify this deed, and that though everybody from the creation of the world had held it to be necessary, on whatever theory, I knew it to be unnecessary and bad, and therefore the arbiter of what is good and evil is not the people who say and do, nor is it progress, but is my heart and I. Another instance of a realization that the superstitious belief in progress is insufficient as a guide of life was my brother's death. Wise, good, serious, he fell ill while still a young man, suffered for more than a year, and died painfully, not understanding why he had lived and still less why he had to die. No theories could give me or him any reply to these questions during his slow and painful dying. But these were only rare instances of doubt, and I actually continued to live, professing a faith only in progress. Everything evolves and I evolve with it, and why it is that I evolved with all things will be known some day. So I ought to have formulated my faith at the time. On returning from abroad, I settled in the country and chanced to occupy myself with peasant schools. This work was particularly to my taste, because in it I had not to face the falsity which had been obvious to me, and had stared me in the face when I tried to teach the people by literary means. Here also I acted in the name of progress, but I already regarded progress itself critically. I said to myself, in some of its developments, progress has proceeded wrongly, and with primitive peasant children, one must deal in a spirit of perfect freedom, letting them choose what path of progress they please. In reality, I was ever revolving round one and the same insolvable problem, which was, how to teach without knowing what to teach. In the higher spheres of literary activity, I realized that one could not teach without knowing what, for I saw that people all taught differently, and by quarreling among themselves only succeeded in hiding their ignorance from one another. But here, with peasant children, I thought to evade this difficulty by letting them learn what they liked. It amuses me now when I remember how I shuffled in trying to satisfy my desire to teach, while in the depth of my soul I knew very well that I could not teach anything needful, for I did not know what was needful. After spending a year at schoolwork, I went abroad a second time to discover how to teach others while myself knowing nothing. And it seemed to me that I had learned this abroad, and in the year of the Peasants' Emancipation, 1861, I returned to Russia armed with all this wisdom. And having become an arbiter, I began to teach both the uneducated peasants in schools and the educated classes through a magazine I published. Things appeared to be going well, but I felt I was not quite sound mentally, and that matters could not long continue in that way. And I should perhaps then have come to the state of despair I reached fifteen years later, had there not been one side of life still unexplored by me, which promised me happiness. That was my marriage. For a year I busied myself with arbitration work, the schools, and the magazine and I became so worn out as a result especially of my mental confusion, and so hard was my struggle as arbiter, so obscure the results of my activity in the schools, so repulsive my shuffling in the magazine, which always amounted to one and the same thing, a desire to teach everybody and to hide the fact that I did not know what to teach, that I felt ill, mentally rather than physically, threw up everything and went away to the Bashkirs in the steppes, to breathe fresh air, drink kumis, and live a merely animal life. Returning from there, I married. The new conditions of happy family life completely diverted me from all search for the general meaning of life. My whole life was centered at that time in my family, wife and children, and therefore in care to increase our means of livelihood. My striving after self-perfection, for which I had already substituted a striving for perfection in general, i.e. progress, was now again replaced by the effort simply to secure the best possible conditions for myself and my family. So another fifteen years passed. In spite of the fact that I now regarded authorship as of no importance, the temptation of immense monetary rewards and the applause for my insignificant work, 
and I devoted myself to it as a means of improving my material position, or of stifling in my soul all questions as to the meaning of my own life, or life in general. I wrote, teaching what was for me the only truth, namely that one should live so as to have the best for oneself and one's family. So I lived. But five years ago, something very strange began to happen to me. At first, I experienced moments of perplexity and the rest of life, as though I did not know what to do or how to live, and I felt lost and became dejected. But this passed and I went on living as before. Then these moments of perplexity began to recur oftener and oftener, and always in the same form. They were always expressed by the questions, what is it for? What does it lead to? At first, it seemed to me that these were aimless and irrelevant questions. I thought that it was all well known, that if I should ever wish to deal with a solution, it would not cost me much effort. Just at present, I had no time for it, but when I wanted to, I should be able to find the answer. The questions, however, began to repeat themselves more frequently, and to demand replies more and more insistently, and like drops of ink always falling on one place, they ran together into one black blot. Then occurred what happens to everyone sickening with a mortal internal disease. At first, trivial signs of indisposition appear, to which the sick man pays no attention. Then these signs reappear more and more often, and merge into one uninterrupted period of suffering. The suffering increases, and before the sick man can look round, what he took for a mere indisposition has already become more important to him than anything else in the world. It is death. That is what happened to me. I understood that it was no casual indisposition, but something very important and that if these questions constantly repeated themselves, they would have to be answered. And I tried to answer them. The questions seemed such stupid, simple, childish ones, but as soon as I touched them and tried to solve them, I at once became convinced, first, that they are not childish and stupid, but the most important and profound of life's questions. And secondly, that occupying myself with my Samara estate, the education of my son, or the writing of a book, I had to know why I was doing it. As long as I did not know why, I could do nothing and could not live. Amid the thoughts of estate management which greatly occupied me at that time, the question would suddenly occur. Well, you will have 6,000 disignatinas of land in the Samara government and 300 horses, and what then? And I was quite disconcerted and did not know what to think. Or when considering plans for the education of my children, I would ask myself, what for? Or when considering how the peasants might become prosperous, I would suddenly say to myself, but what does it matter to me? Or when thinking of the fame my works would bring me, I would say to myself, very well, you will be more famous than Gogol or Pushkin or Shakespeare or Molaire, or than all the writers in the world, and what of it? And I could find no reply at all. The questions would not wait, they had to be answered at once, and if I did not answer them, it was impossible to live, but there was no answer. I felt that what I had been standing on had collapsed, and that I had nothing left under my feet. What I had lived on no longer existed, and there was nothing left. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud My life came to a standstill. I could breathe, eat, drink, and sleep, and I could not help doing these things. But there was no life, for there were no wishes the fulfillment of which I could consider reasonable. If I desired anything, I knew in advance that whether I satisfied my desire or not, nothing would come of it. Had a fairy come and offered to fulfill my desires, I should not have known what to ask. If in moments of intoxication, I felt something which, though not a wish, was a habit left by former wishes, in sober moments, I knew this to be a delusion, and that there was really nothing to wish for. I could not even wish to know the truth, for I guessed of what it consisted. The truth was that life is meaningless. I had, as it were, lived, lived, and walked, walked, till I had come to the precipice and seen clearly that there was nothing ahead of me but destruction. It was impossible to stop, impossible to go back, and impossible to close my eyes or avoid seeing that there was nothing ahead but suffering and real death, complete annihilation. It had come to this, that I, a healthy, fortunate man, felt I could no longer live. Some irresistible power impelled me to rid myself one way or the other of life. I cannot say I wish to kill myself. The power which drew me away from life was stronger, fuller, and more widespread than any mere wish. It was a force similar to the former striving to live, only in a contrary direction. All my strength drew me away from life. The thought of self-destruction now came to me as naturally as thoughts of how to improve my life had come formerly, and it was seductive that I had to be cutting with myself, lest I should carry it out too hastily. I did not wish to hurry, 
because I wanted to use all efforts to disentangle the matter. If I cannot unravel matters, there will always be time. And it was then that I, a man favored by fortune, hit a cord for myself lest I should hang myself from the cross piece of the partition in my room where I undressed alone every evening. And I ceased to go out shooting with a gun lest I should be tempted by so easy a way of ending my life. I did not myself know what I wanted. I feared life, desired to escape from it, and yet still hoped something of it. And all this befell me at a time when all around me I had what is considered complete good fortune. I was not yet fifty. I had a good wife who loved me and whom I loved, good children and a large estate which without much effort on my part improved and increased. I was respected by my relations and acquaintances more than at any previous time. I was praised by others and without much self-deception could consider that my name was famous. And far from being insane or mentally diseased, I enjoyed on the contrary a strength of mind and body such as I had seldom met among men of my kind. Physically I could keep up with the peasants at mowing, and mentally I could work for eight and ten hours at a stretch without experiencing any ill results from such exertion. And in this situation I came to this, that I could not live, and fearing death had to employ cunning with myself to avoid taking my own life. My mental condition presented itself to me in this way. My life is a stupid and spiteful joke someone has played on me. Though I did not acknowledge a someone who created me, yet such a presentation that someone had played an evil and stupid joke on me by placing me in this world was the form of expression that suggested itself most naturally to me. Involuntarily, it appeared to me that there, somewhere, was someone who amused himself by watching how I lived for thirty or forty years, learning, developing, maturing in body and mind, and now having with matured mental powers reached the summit of life from which it all lay before me, I stood on that summit like an arch fool, seeing clearly that there was nothing in life, and that there has been and will be nothing. And he was amused. But whether that someone laughing at me existed or not, I was none the better off. I could give no reasonable meaning to any single action or to my whole life. I was only surprised that I could have avoided understanding this from the very beginning. It had been so long known to all. Today or tomorrow, sickness and death will come. They had come already, to those I love or to me. Nothing will remain but stench and worms. Sooner or later, my affairs, whatever they may be, will be forgotten, and I shall not exist. Then why go on making any effort? How can man fail to see this? And how to go on living? That is what is surprising. One can only live while one is intoxicated with life. As soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all mere fraud and a stupid fraud. That is precisely what it is. There is nothing either amusing or witty about it. It is simply cruel and stupid. There is an eastern fable, told long ago, of a traveler overtaken on a plane by an enraged beast. Escaping from the beast, he gets into a dry well, but sees at the bottom of the well a dragon that has opened his jaws to swallow him. And the unfortunate man, not daring to climb out lest he should be destroyed by the enraged beast, and not daring to leap to the bottom of the well lest he should be eaten by the dragon, seizes a twig growing in a crack in the wall and clings to it. His hands are growing weaker, and he feels that he will soon have to resign himself to the destruction that awaits him above or below, but still he clings on. Then he sees that two mice, a black one and a white one, go regularly around and round the stem of the twig to which he is clinging and gnaw at it. And as soon as the twig itself will snap, he will fall into the dragon's jaws. The traveler sees this and knows that he will inevitably perish, but while still hanging on he looks around, sees some drop of honey on the leaves of the twig, reaches to them with his tongue and licks them. So I too clung to the twig of life, knowing that the dragon of death was inevitably awaiting me, ready to tear me to pieces, and I could not understand why I had fallen into such torment. I tried to lick the honey which formerly consoled me, but the honey no longer gave me pleasure, and the white and black mice of day and night gnawed at the branch by which I hung. I saw the dragon clearly, and the honey no longer tasted sweet. I only saw the inescapable dragon and the mice, and I could not tear my gaze from them. And this is not a fable, but the real unanswerable truth intelligible to all. The deception of the joys of life which formerly allayed my terror of the dragon now no longer deceived me. No matter how often I may be told, you cannot understand the meaning of life, so do not think about it but live. I can no longer do it. I have already done it too long. I cannot now help seeing day and night going round and bringing me to death. That is all I see, for that alone is true. All else is false. The two drops of honey which diverted my eyes from the cruel truth longer than the rest my love of family and of writing, 
art, as I called it, were no longer sweet to me. Family, I said to myself. But my family, wife, and children are also human. They are placed just as I am. They must either live in a lie or see the terrible truth. Why should they live? Why should I love them, guard them, bring them up, or watch them? That they may come to the despair that I feel or else be stupid? Loving them, I cannot hide the truth from them. Each step in knowledge leads them to the truth, and the truth is death. Art? Poetry? Under the influence of success and the praise of men, I had long assured myself that this was the thing one could do, though death was drawing near. Death which destroys all things, including my work and its remembrance. But soon I saw that it too was a fraud. It was plain to me that art is an adornment of life, an allurement to life. But life had lost its attraction for me, so how could I attract others? As long as I was not living my own life, but was born on the waves of some other life, as long as I believed that life had a meaning, though one I could not express, the reflection of life in poetry and art of all kinds afforded me pleasure. It was pleasant to look at life in the mirror of art. But when I began to seek the meaning of life and felt the necessity of living my own life, that mirror became for me unnecessary, superfluous, ridiculous, or painful. I could no longer soothe myself with what I now saw in the mirror, namely that my position was stupid and desperate. It was all very well to enjoy the sight when in the depth of my soul I believed that my life had a meaning. Then the play of lights, comic, tragic, touching, beautiful, and terrible in life, amused me. No sweetness of honey could be sweet to me when I saw the dragon and saw the mice gnawing away my support. Nor was that all. Had I simply understood that life had no meaning, I could have borne it quietly, knowing that that was my lot, but I could not satisfy myself with that. Had I been like a man living in a wood from which he knows there is no exit, I could have lived. But I was like one lost in a wood, who, horrified at having lost his way, rushes about wishing to find the road. He knows that each step he takes confuses him more and more, but still he cannot help rushing about. It was indeed terrible, and to rid myself of the terror I wished to kill myself. I experienced terror at what awaited me, knew that the terror was even worse than the position I was in, but still I could not patiently await the end. However convincing the argument might be that in any case some vessel in my heart would give way, or something would burst and all would be over, I could not patiently await that end. The horror of darkness was too great, and I wished to free myself of it as quickly as possible by a noose or bullet. That was the feeling which drew me most strongly towards suicide. End of chapter 4